Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here tonight, Lord. And, and I just pray now that as we prepare to get into your word, uh, that you would speak to us. Um, God, for, for, for those who are here who are your children, Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear, that we would have um, hearts that are open, um, willing to obey what you have for us tonight. And God, I also pray for those that may not know you, those that are far away from you, those that maybe think they know you, but they don't. God, I pray that you would also open their ears and open their eyes and open their hearts to see and understand the truth of, of your love and your good news. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys. So um, please, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. As I say every week, open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. I'm going to open up there too. And if you're wondering, that's page 875. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's going to turn to 875 and they're like, no, it's not. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 7, page 875. So uh, for you first timers, for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, we are studying through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we've been... Um, making our way, uh, studying slowly, making our way through, through the gospel over the past year, over a year now. Um, and we're currently, as you could tell, on the Sermon on the Mount. So we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And, um, and I just want to say for you first-timers, uh, if, if, you, if you enjoy what you hear tonight and you want to hear more, uh, you could just search Zeal Young Adults. That's the name of our ministry. Search us on YouTube or Spotify, and you can hear tonight's message in a couple of days, and you can hear all the messages that we've been going through in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, just for you, just so you all know. Um, listening to past messages is, 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 I'm sure, beneficial. You know, many people, many people have, have come up to me and just talked about how, like, you know, how, how blessed they were to hear the message, how powerful the message was and how edifying it was. Their words, not mine, so I'm not boasting. It's just, that's what people say. So I encourage you, if you, if, if you want to hear some stuff, just go check us out. Um, but before we get into our study in Matthew chapter 7, um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts uh, with you guys. Sorry. Um, you know, th this, this week leading up to tonight, uh, the Lord, uh, he's, he was speaking to me about a couple of things um, that I believe they have kind of, they, they relate to what we're going to be looking at tonight in Matthew chapter 7. It's kind of how the Lord works. Um, but um, as I just stated, and as I've stated in the past, many of you will, will come to me and you'll offer like inc really encouraging words, uh, just talking about how like you were blessed by a particular study or how a particular study was, was powerful, or it was convicting, or it was encouraging, or it was eye-opening, you know, whatever, whatever you guys say. And, and, and like I said, it's very encouraging to hear those things. It kind of helps me know that, like, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Because uh, throughout the week, I'm like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing here. So thank you for that encouragement. Um, uh, but one thing that, that the Lord spoke to me this week is to not get lost in the powerful message. Like, don't get lost in the powerful message. And what I mean by that is that there is a danger of us becoming uh, professional Bible study listeners. You know, we can just become professional Bible study listeners. Uh, you know, we, we, we can reduce our walk with Christ down to being an audience member, you know, who is waiting for the crescendo of the message, waiting for that moment where, oh, that was so powerful, or oh, that was so good, like, oh, that was encouraging or convicting, or you, you feel like the Lord spoke. And in, in and of itself, that's not a bad thing. Of course, we want to hear the Lord speak to us. It's always a good thing when the Lord speaks to us through, um, you know, through a Bible study or through the Word. That's what we want. But what are we doing with that? After it happens, what are we doing with that? Are, are we taking the words home with us, and are we uh, allowing change to happen? Are, are we allowing the Lord to change us because of what we heard? Or are we simply saying like, mm, that was delicious. I wonder what the Lord has cooked up next week. Now, if, if you've ever attended a, a Friday night and you've been blown away by what God has said during the study and 
You were even moved to tell me, which again is very encouraging. You don't have to. I'm not saying this like, please encourage me. No, no, no. Uh, you don't have to. Please don't feel obligated. Um, but if you've ever been here on a Friday night and you've been really encouraged by, by whatever was spoken uh, on a Friday night, um, but nothing happens as a result, there's no change, there's no repentance, there's no greater nearness to Jesus then who cares? Who cares how great the message was? It doesn't matter. Who cares? It's, it's not about accumulating knowledge. It's not about listening to as many powerful messages as you possibly can and, then, and, and becoming a professional convicted person. Like, oh, that was so convicting. Oh, that was so convicting. You just become a pro at being convicted. It's not about that. If you're not growing, who cares? Who cares? The point of all this is to grow. That's why we're here. The point of all this is to grow, but not just, not just for your own growth. The, the point is so that you can grow so that you can help others grow too in the body of Christ. It's about all of our growth collectively. It's the benefit of the body. But in order to grow, you need to slow down. You just, you need to slow down. Don't be so quick to move on to the next thing, the next spiritual high. The, the next experience, the next powerful message, chew on this stuff. Chew on it. Take, take, take it to the Lord in prayer. Talk to God about this really convicting message and how he actually wants you to change and how he wants you to repent. You know, we've read Psalm 1 quite a few times here on, on Friday night. Psalm 1, it says that the person who is happy and blessed, uh, they, they are happy and blessed when they don't walk in the advice of the wicked. They don't, uh, when they don't stand with sinners, when, when they don't associate with mockers of God. This person is like a tree planted next to a stream of water, is what it says, next to a forever source of life. So this person is always bearing fruit. This person is always healthy. Their leaf does not wither, is what it says. And whatever this person does, he or she prospers. And the key to this person's blessedness and this person's happiness is not simply that they avoid the wicked, sinful mockers of God. The key to their happiness and their blessedness is found in Psalm 1, verse 2, where it says, instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. Meditating on the Lord's instruction, meditating on the word of God and the proclamation of the word of God. And, and now I don't mean meditating on it like in like the new age concept of meditation. We're not over here trying to empty our minds, getting rid of everything so that demons can speak to us. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the meditation that the Bible is talking about. The Hebrew word that was translated to meditate, it, it, it does mean to ponder to muse, to imagine, but it also means to mutter, to utter, and to speak. You are, you are pondering and musing and uttering and speaking on the Lord's instruction when you meditate on the Lord's instruction. And you can't do that if you're bouncing from message to message to YouTube short to Instagram reel to TikTok video to this clip and that clip and all of these inputs You need to slow down. You need to slow down. And you need to chew on this stuff. You need to meditate on this stuff. You need to meditate on the Lord's instruction. We cannot forget the simple act of abiding in Christ. The simple act of abiding in Christ. Abiding in the true vine that is Jesus. Being connected to Jesus. And, and we, we can inadvertently get disconnected from Jesus when all we're doing is seeking to be hit by the latest and greatest revelation, regardless of the source. And the other thing that the Lord spoke to me about this week is the fact that we are, we are the body. We are his body. We, we are his body. We're his body. Those who have entered into the kingdom of heaven because of their faith, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, those who have received Jesus, we are his church. We are his body. We are his children. We have been given that right, according to John 1.12. No one else has the right to be called the child of God, 
According to John 1.12, the only people who have the right to be called a child of God are those who have received Jesus. No one else has that right. And because we are his church, because we are his body, because we are his children, he takes very seriously our dealings with each other. He takes it very seriously. My oldest child is five years old. He's my, my, the heir to my estate. He's not going to get much, but the, he's, <laughs> my oldest child is, is five years old, my boy, Caleb. And this little boy is impressive. You know, I know a lot of parents say that about their children, but th- I actually, this is actually true. Like, my boy is impressive. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, he's smart, this boy. He's smart. He's hilarious. He's learning how to play the piano, and he is such a quick learner. Oh, it's crazy. He's so talented. And, and look, me and my wife, we didn't do anything to make him that way. This is just how God packaged him. Like, this is how he came to us. We just signed for it. And it was like, all right, this is what we got. Great, thank you. We're not going to return this one. The, the other ones, I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but man, this little boy, like, he'll remember scripture. Like, he remembers scripture. His, his, his prayers have, have gotten so mature lately. They've become so, so much more thoughtful lately, his prayers. I love this kid. He's amazing. But the thing that I love most, the thing that I love most about him, the thing that warms my heart the most and what I'm most proud of is how he treats his siblings, how he treats his younger sister and and now his new baby brother, his love for them. and, And when his love for them is on display, his love in action, that's when I am most proud and most pleased with him. It's beautiful, like when he shares with his sister, when, when he is kind with his sister. I mean, he, he, it's, it's really easy to be kind to the baby. You know, his baby's only three months old, doesn't do anything. But his sister, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where love has to, has to be uh, purposeful, you know, because, you know, they butt heads. Uh, but, you know, he's kind with her. He shares with his sister when he's unconditionally loving towards his sister, when, when, when he gives her his last piece of food uh, that he's really enjoying, but he gives it to her because he knows that she really enjoys it too. And so he's like, no, I'm going to give it to her because he wants to bless her. He wants her to be happy. He wants to show love. You know, when I, when I sit them down for breakfast and I, I give them each their respective utensil and my little girl has a cow because I gave her the wrong utensil, no, she wanted that one. Like, that one's blue, that one's green. She wanted the blue one. How dare I give her the wrong colored utensil? And I'm just like, I don't even want to hear you right now because what a ridiculous thing to have a cow over. But then my son will be like, you want to trade? I'm just like, Caleb, you don't need to do that. No, I just, she wants this one, so I'll trade with her. And it's amazing. And it's not just one way, because the, the, the girl, she's very kind towards her brother. She loves her brother. You know, she'll go up to him. She'll hug him. Uh, she'll, she always seeks him out. Like, anytime she does something, she's like, look, KK. She calls him KK. Um, his name's Caleb, but she calls him KK. It's cute. Um, she loves him. They wrestle with each other. They love each other. Um, it's just a beautiful thing for me as a dad to see my children love each other. You know, they're very, they're very protective over each other. My son, even like when, like when we're wrestling, I'll pretend to like kidnap my, my daughter and he'll like, the, the kid will punch me in the throat. Like I taught him, but I'm like, dude, don't do it on me. Like I was like, dude, if you ever are attacked by somebody out there, punch them in the throat, not me. Like that hurt. Dude, he's, 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 got, he's, got a, he's got a mean jab, <laughs> but um, you know, they're protective over each other. And, and to date, the most, the most beautiful, the most beautiful, a display of love that I've ever seen between the two of them was one time we came home from groceries and they have this toy register that has like a little scanner. Every time we come home from groceries, they'll, like, they'll scan all the items and then they'll calculate how much it costs and it's like millions of dollars that our groceries cost apparently. And so, but on, on one time that we came home, the, the little girl, she was just being unkind to her brother. And so we're like, you know what? No, we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna allow that. And so we, we, we sent her away. We, we punished her. <gasps> yeah, yes, we, we, we discipline our children. And so we, we, we punished her. And, um, and all, we told her, like, all you need to do is you just apologize to your brother, give him a hug, because you're being very unkind to him, and, um, and then you'll be fine. You, you can come back. But she refused. She refused to do that. She was being so proud. Uh, and, and she was so upset, so upset, and so sad in the moment because she couldn't go play. She couldn't go join the play. Um, but so was Caleb. <laughs> Caleb was so upset and so sad that, that she couldn't play. He, he hates seeing her sad. And so he began to plead with her 
Like he's just like, no, at least just it's okay. Just 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 say just say sorry. Like and 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 like just put your arms around me and, and, and it'll be okay. And he wasn't saying these things because he's like, no, I deserve an apology from you, and I deserve for you to feel bad. No, it was just like he didn't care. Like, just fake it. And because I just want you to come back. I want you to be happy. I don't like when you're sad. He was pretty much begging her <laughs> to, to do these things. And, and it was just beautiful. And so eventually she gave in, she did the thing. And then, you know, all was well. They were playing together and all that stuff. And it, but it, it so touched my heart that I was like, hey, Kayla, let me ask you something. If you could have traded places with her, like if, if, if you could have been the one that was in trouble, not allowed to play, so that your sister could be the one out there playing, would you have done it? And he said, yeah. It's like, why? Because like, I love her. Like, I don't want her to be sad. I want her to be happy. It's beautiful. As a dad, as a dad, nothing makes me more proud and more pleased with my kids than when they are being loving towards each other. Like, I love their personalities. I love their talents. I love their prayers. But... I love the most their love for each other and when it's on display. Now, if that's how I feel as a dad on this earth, as an earthly dad, how much more does our heavenly father love to see his kids being loving towards each other and having displays of love for each other? John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, it says, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You guys, look around. Look around at the church. Not just tonight, but, but on Sundays and on Thursdays as well. This local body of believers here at, at Core Church LA, as well as the church globally around the world, these are your brothers and these are your sisters. And God loves it. He loves it when we are loving towards each other. I was listening to one of my favorite Bible teachers this week, and he pointed out that in 1 Corinthians 12, you don't have to turn there, but when Paul is talking to us uh, about the body of Christ, about us being the body of Christ, this is what he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 18 through 21. It says, but as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts of the body just as he wanted. And if they, if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We cannot say, we cannot say that we do not need each other. It's not that we shouldn't say it. The Holy Spirit is telling us that we cannot say that we don't need each other. I cannot say, Drew, I don't need you. Daniel, you can't say, Alejandro, I don't need you. Andy, you can't say to Kelly, I don't need you. We cannot say this to each other. We are God's children, and we are the body of Christ. We need each other. We need each other. And we don't just need those that are here on Friday nights at Zeal. Zeal is a part of Core Church LA. Zeal is a ministry of Core Church LA. And if Core Church LA is your home, then you need the entire body at Core Church LA. For those of you who consider Core Church your home, let me challenge you with this. And, and if you just attend Zeal on Friday nights, but you have another home church that you attend on Sundays, that's fine because they don't have a young adults group maybe. I would, it doesn't matter. This challenge still applies to you as well. Wherever your home church is, let me present you with these questions. How many believers, other than the ones who attend zeal, do you know? How many older believers do you know and converse with and have relationship with? How many younger believers do you know and have relationship with and have conversations with? How many members of the body of Christ, other than the folks who come to zeal, do you have some sort of relationship with? Sure, you, you attend Sundays, and maybe you even attend Thursday night midweek studies. But when you come to Sundays, and when you come to Thursdays, is it basically just like coming to Zeal because those, those are the only people that you hang out with anyway? Think about that. 
We are the body of Christ, and we cannot say that there are parts of the body that we do not need. But are you acting like it? Are you acting like it? Does your fellowship and the people you choose to fellowship with communicate that there are parts of the body that you do not need? I'm cool. I'm chilling. Like, I'm good. I'm good with the people that I know here on Friday nights. I don't really need to know anybody else. I'm not saying that you need to know every single person. I'm not saying that you need to know every single person who comes to CORE, and you need to have a relationship with every single person who's in this place. Because frankly, not every single person who comes to CORE is a, is a believer. And additionally, it would be impossible to, to, to have a relationship with every single person who comes to this church. There are a lot of people who come to this church. But we are the body. We are the body, and we need every single member of that body, and our interaction with this body should also extend beyond the, this clique of zeal young adults. You know, prior to me coming into this position as pastor, there was always talk about how, oh yeah, this young adults group is so clicky. There's, there's this click and that click and that click, and I'm sure it was true because, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> but when... But when when the Lord brought me here, that all went away. Not because, not because of me. It's just because everybody was like, okay, we're going to listen to the Holy Spirit. And that, that whole click thing went away. But now, is there a click of just you? And when you're here on Sundays or any other time we have services, is, are, you, are, you, are you sticking with this click? How many of you on Sundays or Thursdays are you looking to pray for someone? How many of you on Sundays or Thursdays are you looking to welcome a first-timer to your home church? Your home church. How many of you on Sundays or Thursdays are looking for that loner or that person who rushes in and rushes out to, 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 to stop them, to slow them down, and to help them to understand that, hey, yo, you need fellowship. You should, you should, you should stick around. You need fellowship. How many of you on Sundays or Thursdays are looking to serve the body by being active in fellowship, active in prayer, active in sharing scripture, active in showing love? If you're thinking, Pastor, isn't that what you're here for? Of course, of course. But that's what you're here for too. That's what you are here for too. This isn't a company or a business. Where, where those of us who are on staff at this church, we're like the co-owners of this business and the success of this business depends on us. No, no, no. This is the body of Christ. And every single one of us, those of us who are believers who are part of this body of Christ, we are all responsible for the success of this thing. This is the body of Christ. We all have a job to do here, if this is your home. We all have a job to do here. For many, I believe that that is actually like actually picking up a hammer or picking up a shovel or picking up a camera or picking up a children's ministry curriculum book and, and actually serving the body in, in, a, in a practical way. But at the absolute very least, everybody, even those who are, who are, who are actively serving in a, in a physical and practical way, at the very least, we are all, we are all involved in the business of fellowship interacting with the body, praying for each other, welcoming each other, encouraging each other, evangelizing to the non-believers who may be visiting. It's not just the responsibility of the preacher. We all know the gospel. We all know what it takes to, for, for someone to be saved and enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not just the pastor or the preacher who is responsible for sharing the good news with people. And this isn't something that needs to get assigned to you officially as a volunteer at Core Church LA. Here's your name badge. Now go pray with someone. It's what we're supposed to do. This is just what we should be doing. My body, it interacts with itself, especially after eating spicy food. There's a lot of interactions that are going on. You know, you know, some of y'all lactose. Y'all get some dairy in you. Your body is interacting, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and there are a lot of things going on in this body that I'm unaware of. I don't know what's going on in this body a lot of the times. Like, there's just stuff, stuff is happening, and I'm unaware of it. A lot of communication, a lot of synchronization going on in this body, and that's just what it does because that's what it was designed to do. And so it is with the body of Christ. We need each other. We need each other. 
We cannot say that we do not need each other. We need to interact with each other. And so with all that in mind, uh, let's now shift our focus to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the title of tonight's message, if you're taking notes, is Just Ask. Just Ask. And now you may be thinking, like, man, we're like halfway through a... We're halfway through the, through the night already, and we're just getting into the scripts. Yes, it, don't worry. It's, it's a very simple message that is going to be communicated tonight. Very simple, um, and it really all depends. Are we going to be obedient to, the, to the sim, this simple message, no matter how simple it is? So let's just dive in. Let's begin reading uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 7 through 12, and this is what it says. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. I'm sure many of you have heard this scripture, the golden rule. I live by the golden rule. When we looked at the closing verses of Matthew chapter 6, uh, what was it, like two or three weeks ago, you know, Jesus was telling us that we don't need to worry. Like, we don't need to worry about our needs. If we would just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of our needs are going to be provided for us. He's going to provide our needs. And then we looked at uh, the opening verses of Matthew 7 last week, and Jesus was telling us that we need to exercise righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. He told us not to judge self-righteously, but to judge ourselves first. We need to assess ourselves first, and then from that place of humility, assist our brothers and sisters in removing sin from their lives. And now, in the verses that we just read tonight, uh, there's a bit of a meshing of these two ideas. Uh, Jesus is telling us, as we deal with our brothers and sisters, not in the context of judgment or correction, but as we deal with our brothers and sisters in the context of love and care, we can be free. We can be free to love and care for them as we would want to be loved and cared for without fear of lack because all we have to do is ask, seek, and knock, and we will receive, we will find, doors will be opened. And to tell you the truth, I never really understood this collection of verses in the way that I understand it now until I studied it for the purposes of tonight's message. For years, I've, you know, I've, read, the ser I've read the Sermon on the Mount many, many times. You know, I've been walking with the Lord 15 years. I've read, I've read Matthew many times but I never really saw what I saw uh, this week. Because, um, you know, I was reading other people's commentaries and just kind of praying through it. Um, but I realized what these verses are communicating. And Jesus starts, he starts by telling us that if we ask our Heavenly Father for something, we will receive the thing that we're asking for. That's what he starts off by saying. If we're seeking something from our Heavenly Father, we will find what we're seeking. And if we knock on the, on the proverbial door uh, for something, so a door that we want opened, the door will be opened by our Father. He will open the door for us. Now, this isn't a blank check. This, this is not a blank check that Jesus is trying to tell us about. Like, ask for whatever you want and it's going to happen. You know, just because you ask God for something doesn't mean he's obligated to give it to you. It doesn't work that way. He still has a will. God has a will. And in the context of our salvation, but it definitely applies to more than just salvation, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, In him we have also received an inheritance, because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. He works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So just because you are seeking a winning lottery ticket doesn't mean that God is going to give it to you. James 4, verses 2 and 3, it says, You desire and you do not have. You murder and covet and you cannot attain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So for our verses in Matthew 7, 
It's clear. It's clear that the things we will receive and the things that we will find and the doors that will be opened to us will be things that are asked for and sought after and knocked on in accordance with God's will. And he says, you earthly dads, you earthly dads, you're you're not going to give your kids something harmful when they're asking for something good. Thinking about my own kids, like I, I try to imagine, it's hard to imagine, but I try to imagine, you know, my kid is coming to me and he's hungry. Both of my kids come to me, they're hungry, and they're just like, can we get some bread? And I'm like, yeah, here's a rock. And, and, just, and, and just thinking about doing that, like in a serious way, and seeing the look of disappointment in their face, the, the look of hurt in their face, as, as they're like, this is, this is the man that I trust. Like, I could come to him for anything, and, and I've never doubted that he would show me love and provide for me. Like, kids don't have to think about these things. They don't, they don't, they don't think about these things. They don't think like, oh, man, I wonder if my dad is going to hook me up today. Like, my kids wake up in the morning, they know that breakfast is coming because dad gives it to them. And so I I just imagining like, okay, here's a rock. And it's just like, everything comes crumbling down. How, how, how sad would they be? How, how depressed would they be? How, how heartbroken would they be if that's what I did to them? It's not even something that I want to spend too much time thinking about because like, I just, I imagine their faces and it's, it's heartbreaking. And if it would break my heart to imagine me treating my own children that way, how much more heartbreaking would it be to God? And not that he could ever conceive a a hypothetical situation where he gives us something harmful. So it's not like it would break his heart to think of himself giving us something that would be harmful to us. But how heartbreaking, how heartbreaking is it to God if we have this perception of God in our minds? That if we ask him for something good and something that's in accordance with his will, we, we would think he's not going to give us that good thing that we are asking for. Instead, he would give us something harmful. It would break God's heart if we actually thought this way about him. I was born with the fallen nature. All of us were born with the fallen nature. I was born with the fallen nature. And though I have been born again and I have a new nature I still have the the flesh that lingers with me, the the indwelling sin that lingers with me. And in spite of that, I still know how to give good things to my kids. I know how to give good things to my kids. And there are many men, there are many men out there who don't know Jesus, who aren't born again. They're still dead in their sins and their trespasses. And they are dads. And they know how to give good things to their kids. If we fallen humans know how to be good to our children, How much more does our heavenly father know how to be good to his children, his children that he paid the ultimate price for? He he paid the price to adopt us. And in light of God's goodness to his children, in light of the fact that that he will not withhold good things from his children, in light of the fact that God will always supply our needs, in light of the fact that our Father tells us that if we just ask, seek, and knock, if we just keep asking, if we keep seeking, if we keep knocking, he will give us the good things that we're asking for. In light of this security that we have in God, Matthew 7, 12 says, therefore, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Jesus gives us the security and the guarantee that if we ask and keep asking, that if we seek and we keep seeking, if we knock and we keep knocking, Whatever it is that we are asking and looking for, God will give it to us according to his will. And he gives us this assurance and security so that we can be free to do for others the things that we would want done for us. If we, if we were in, in, in real and desperate need, we would want somebody to have compassion on us and help us out. If we were lacking in something that we needed, we would want somebody to come to our rescue and supply our need. 
So if we see a brother or a sister in need, because we would want someone to help us in our need, we should help our brothers and sisters in need. We may be tempted to worry about our own well-being whenever we are presented with opportunities to help others in need, but that's why Jesus gives us the assurances that he gives us. At the end of Matthew 6, he says, don't worry about your basic needs. Don't worry about them. Seek first the kingdom and my righteousness. All your needs will be met. And then in our verses in Matthew 7, he, he doubles down and he tells us, whatever you request from the Lord in prayer, he will give you. He'll give it to you. So if we put ourselves at a financial disadvantage or any kind of disadvantage in order to do for someone something that we would want done for us, God will replenish. God will restock. He restocks it. We have a never-ending supply of resources in our Heavenly Father. All we need to do is just ask. Just ask. So we never have to worry about ever lacking anything as a result of, of giving to others or supplying a need for others because God is telling us, I want you to love your brothers and sisters. I want you to love your brothers and sisters. I want you to do for them what you would want done for you. I so want you to do this that I will be your insurance policy. I'll do it. I'll be your collateral. If you're ever worried about something coming up and you're not having the resources to cover that thing that comes up, I'll cover you. It's all mine anyway. I'll cover you. Just fulfill the law and the prophets and love your siblings in Christ. Now, for those of you who are hearing this message and you're already thinking about the ways that you could hustle your brothers and sisters, like, oh, well, if that's the case, I'm going shopping. You think you're going to Hustle your brothers and sisters to like, hey, you're supposed to help me in my need. If that's what you're thinking, I would question whether or not you yourself are actually a brother or a sister in Christ. But if you think that you found a way to fund your laziness, we've gone through this before. Uh, the Bible says that if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. The Bible says that we are to do all that we do as unto him, as if we are doing it for him. The Bible says that we are to serve and submit to our earthly masters, a.k.a. our bosses, even if they're complete jerks. We are supposed to work. The Bible provides no avenue for laziness. No avenue for laziness. We are to work. We are to work hard. We are not to be idle. If you don't have a job, you have a job. It's looking for a job. That's your job. And if you need a job, oh boy, you're not picky about a job. You are not picky about a job. You take the job that's in front of you. I've been on unemployment for six months, but I don't know if I should take this job at Subway. Or well, are they offering you the job? Yeah. Then you should take the job. It's work. Nothing is below you. Nothing is below you. Get over yourself. Work. I mentioned this last time we were on this topic, like three or four weeks ago. But some people will claim, oh man, I really need a place to stay. I really need a place to stay. But really what they need is they need to humble themselves and they need to go back home. What do you mean go back home? My family's there. Yeah. My family's the problem. No, you're the problem. <laughs> go back home. You don't need a place to stay. You have a place to stay. You just need to humble yourself. And plus, you're supposed to be a peacemaker, according to Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. We're supposed to be peacemakers. As much as I love when my children share with each other, as much as I love it when my children share with each other, the one thing, the one thing that I do not tolerate, the one thing I do not tolerate is when they demand the other sibling share something with them. Oh, no. We're not doing that. You're not going to demand. If they ever assume or demand to have something because you're supposed to share, I put a stop to that immediately. 
immediately. I will not allow them to take from each other. And if one of them ever tries to take from the other and make demands, the demander, they lose any claim that they had on that thing that they were wanting. Just because they are brothers and sisters, and just because we have communicated to them that there is this expectation of sharing with each other, that does not give either one of them the right to demand that something be shared with them. Absolutely not. And I would dare say that if I feel that way as an earthly father, I would dare say that our heavenly father feels the same way. He must have the same feelings towards those of us who may be demanding that our brothers and sisters share with us. We've had many people call the church, many people call the church basically demanding that we give them money. I'm a Christian. You need to give me money. I'm a Christian. You need to find me a job. I was not aware <laughs> that that's what we do here. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's funny because there are many people who, who, who have attempted um, to, to call and ask for help, and we've attempted to help them. And, and you know, many, many people in the body have attempted to help them, but the problem is that we were giving them the help that they didn't want. They were expecting an envelope of cash, but we were trying to help them. I mean, the, the body of Christ, trying to help them build up their resume, trying to help them apply for jobs, trying to help them do all these things. And that's not the help that they wanted. They just wanted cash. But we're not going to give in to those demands. As the church, we're not going to give in to those that are demanding that they be served. And going back to my kids, if, if, if the demands are made and thus the demander loses the opportunity to get what they were demanding. But if the other child decides to share regardless, man, that's super heartwarming. That's heartwarming as a dad, you know? Given the pride that was being communicated through the one, are you gonna share with me? Give me that. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not. That's not happening. But then the other one will be like, no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Like, oh man, that's great. That's great but I would never make the one who's being demanded share with the demander. Never, never. You don't deserve it. My go-to response is to withhold the, from the person who is proudly demanding something from their sibling. Is our heavenly father the same way? I would say yes. I would say yes, but I'm open to being wrong. Holy Spirit, please you know, speak to us. So, like I said, simple message tonight. Uh, but let us marinate. Let us marinate and meditate on these things. Let, let, us, let us chew on these things. Let us slow down and ponder on these things. Slow down and speak these things to ourselves as we digest them. Let us not forget that we are his church. We are his church. We are his body. We are his children. And let us not think that we don't need each other. We cannot think that way. And not just here at Zeal, but I'm talking about if Core Church LA is your home, you need every single person that comes to Core Church LA. And if you have another church home, like I said, don't think that you don't need them. We simply cannot think that way. We need each other. And let us do for others that we would want them to do for us. And let us do those things with confidence and faith, knowing that our Heavenly Father is our insurance policy. Anything that we need or anything that we may lose as a result of doing for others, let us believe that if we ask, seek, and knock, and keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, that we'll receive what we're asking for according to His will and according to His riches in Christ Jesus. And let us not be demanding. Remember, Ask, seek, and knock. You don't have to be demanding. You don't have to be demanding. Someone who is demanding of others isn't confident in God's love and care for them. Someone who is demanding of others, they, they don't believe God when he says to seek first his kingdom and to seek his righteousness and he'll provide their needs for them. They don't believe God. They may not even be interested in hearing that stuff. Don't give me that Bible stuff. Just give me what I need. I talked to a person and, and, you know, they're telling me all about it. And I'm like, look, I'm just, I'm telling you, Jesus said, seek first 
his kingdom and his righteousness and all of your needs will be provided. I don't need to hear that stuff. I've been, I know the Bible. <sighs> Doesn't seem like you do. Let us not be demanding. Let us not display that we're not trusting God. But let's meditate on these things. Let us abide in the vine that is Jesus. Let us be satisfied with just being in his presence and being his child. Let's put away the pursuits, put away the dreams, put away the aspirations, put it all away. Just, just, be, just be content and satisfied in the fact that you are his, that you are his child. And, and I wanted to read a psalm. So if you guys could, if you guys could turn to, to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, we're going to read the first five verses. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. For he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity. He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. That is a beautiful comfort for us believers. God will take care of us. God will be our shelter. God will be our covering. Let us just be satisfied. Let us just desire just to dwell with him, to dwell in his temple, to gaze at his beauty. Let us just be satisfied with that. And if, and if you're in here and, and, and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you don't know God, that probably sounds weird. Like, what do you mean, be satisfied in his presence? Like, what, is, what does that even mean? Well, I, want, I, want to, I wanted to communicate something to anybody who, who maybe doesn't know Jesus, but even also to you believers in here. We all need to hear the gospel over and over and over again. Every single one of us is born dead in our sins and our trespasses. Every single one of us is born with the separation between us and God. We all have sin in our lives. The Bible is very clear about sin. It's very clear. All of us are born with it. All of us are born sick with this sin. Actually, let me take that back. We're not sick, we're dead. We're dead. We are born spiritually dead. But God, because he loves us so much, he decided to do something amazing in order to take care of that sin problem that we have, to take care of this issue that is keeping us separated from him. And what he did is that, here's, here's the dilemma. God is holy and God is just. And because we are all sinners, because we've all sinned against God, his justice demands that we be punished for eternity in hell. His justice demands that. His, basically, with our lives, we are saying, God, I don't want you. You're saying that this lifestyle that I'm living is wrong. I disagree with you, so I don't want you. And so when we get to the end, it is appointed for each person to die once, and then comes the judgment. God says, okay, then I'll give it to you. If, if that's what you want, if you, don't, if you don't want a life with me because you love your lifestyle more than you love me, then you can have it. The problem is that that separation from God is an eternity of torments, weeping, gnashing of teeth. The Bible describes hell as not a, not a pretty place. But instead of that, because God's justice must be satisfied, he sent his one and only son he sent his son. God came in the form of a man. And though he was the exact, he, he, was, he, was, he was God. He is God. He's the exact representation of God's nature. Though he was that, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't think it something for him to take advantage of, the fact that he was God. So instead of, instead of being God, he emptied himself. And he came down to this earth for one purpose, 
And that was to take the punishment for our sins, to take it, to go to that cross, to be whipped, to be beaten, and to be crucified on that cross. And while he was on that cross, God was pouring out all of his justice and his wrath on his only begotten son. And then he died, he rose again, proving that, hey, I did it. I am the perfect sacrifice for your sins. And the Bible says that if you believe in Jesus, you will have eternal life. But it's, 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 uh, there's, there's a lot of detail in that. When you believe in Jesus, Jesus takes all of your sins. He takes all of your sins. All of those things that you've done, all the ways that you have fallen short of the glory of God, he takes all of them. He took, he took those things with him on the cross and they were nailed to the cross. And not only that, not only does he empty you of all of your sins and he takes them all away, he gives you his perfection. He gives you his righteousness so that when you stand before God, you can stand confident in saying, I am perfect, not because I am perfect, but because Jesus is perfect on my behalf. I'm wearing his clothes. I'm wearing his righteousness. I am the righteousness of Christ. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He died and rose again so that he can give us all of his perfection so that when we stand before God, we stand blameless. We are perfect when we stand before God. Not because we are practically perfect. Not yet. We're working on it and we won't be there until we get to heaven but we are spiritually perfect, we are clean, we are spotless. But why did he do this? Why, why would he do this? Because he loves us, he loves you. That, that is like the, the, the major thing about all of this is that God loves you. For God so loved the world, but you can replace the world and insert your name. For God so loved Abel, that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, so that if Abel believes in him, he won't perish, but he'll have eternal life. For God so loved Melody that if she would believe in Jesus, she would have eternal life. For God so loved Andy that if he would believe in Jesus, he would have eternal life. He wouldn't perish. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that if you would just believe in him, you can have eternal life. You can be forgiven. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. Uh, and I'm, Many of you know my testimony. I, before I came to Christ, I didn't grow up in the church. <laughs> before I came to Christ, I was, I, was, I was a drunkard. I drank a lot and I loved it. I loved to drink. And, and uh, forgive me if you've heard this before, but you know, like you, you, you'll often hear stories of people who hit rock bottom and then that's how they come to Christ. Praise the Lord. Sometimes somebody got to hit rock bottom before they'll come to the Lord. Those are the hard-headed ones. That wasn't like that for me. I never, I didn't hit rock bottom. I was, I was at the height of my enjoyment of my sin. I was like, dude, I love drinking. I love partying. I love having sex. I love doing all all of the things. I'm free to do whatever I want. If I want to do some drugs, it's all good. If I want to, do, if I want to smoke weed, I'll smoke weed. Uh, if I want to, whatever. Like if I, if, if I, you know, oh man, look at that Frank Sinatra album. Uh, I don't want to pay for it. I'll just steal it. You know, like if, whatever I wanted to do, I would do it. And, and the way that I would rationalize is like, I'm not hurting anybody. You know, and, and many of us, many of us, that, that's what we have. That, that's our story. Some of you may still be in that like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. You, what, what God says is sinful is sinful, sure, but I'm not hurting anybody. So what does it matter? The thing that I'm doing, the, the, the lifestyle that I'm living, it's not hurting anybody. So why does God have a problem with it? Why should it, be a, why should it be an issue? There are no victims of the things that I am doing. And sure, you may be right. Yeah, there's no victims of your decision to drink. There's no decision of, uh, there's, no, um, um, there's no victims as a result of your decision to have consensual sex with somebody, be it male or female, same sex, opposite sex, whatever. You know, there may be no victims of any of it, but the fact of the matter is, is that God says that it is sinful 
when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they looked at the fruit. God said, you can eat everything you want in this garden except for this one tree, this one fruit. Don't touch that one. Don't eat that one. But then what happened? Eve was hanging around the tree, and then the serpent came around. Hey, tree looks good, right? Like, yeah, but it's like, are you sure God said that you're not supposed to eat any tree? Like, did, he, did he really say you're not supposed to eat of any tree? And he was like, no, 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 we, we could eat of any tree. It's just from this tree right here, this fruit. We can't eat it. We also can't touch it. God didn't say that. Like, we can't eat this and we can't touch it. And, and then the servant is like, yeah, but look at it. It's, you're not going to die if you eat this fruit. What's going to happen is you're going to become like God. Your eyes are going to be opened. You're going you're to be able to see the way that God sees things. Oh, and how enticing is that? You get to be your own God. You get to make your own decisions. You get to decide what's right and wrong. And then the Bible says that the fruit that was hanging on that tree, that it looked delicious. It looked nourishing. It wasn't like a weird looking fruit. It was like, man, that looks really tasty. And it looks like it's nutritious. It looks like it'll be good for me. Oh, hello, parallel to, to our lives now. Yeah, this lifestyle that I'm living, I'm not hurting anybody. And actually, it's of great benefit to me. I've never been at more peace in my life. But God says, don't do that. God says, don't do that. That is a forbidden fruit. And the reason I'm forbidding it is that it's going to be harmful for you. You think it's going to be good. Eve saw the fruit. was like, man, this thing looks delicious. And it looks nutritious. So she grabbed it. She ate of it. She gave to her husband. He ate of it. And they died. It appeared good. It appeared beneficial. It appeared delicious. But it killed them. And so it is with our sins. It appears good. What's wrong with it? I'm just having fun. What's wrong with it? I'm just, I'm just being me. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. You have been made in the image of God. And God is giving you a sense of right and wrong. God is giving you a sense of his laws. He's written them on your heart. And you know, you know deep down inside that what you're doing is wrong. Because God is giving you that sense. He's telling you, don't eat that. And that's why he died for us. That's why he came. He came to, to pay the, penal, the penalty for, for those things that we willingly do. Step into the light. We looked at this a, a couple of weeks ago. Step into the light. Step into the light of Christ. There are people who, who, who don't want to come to the light of Christ. There are people who don't want to come to God because they feel like when they come to God, all that's going to be seen is all of their evil deeds. They're going to be completely exposed. That all that, that's all that's God, that God is going to see. It's like, no, I don't want to come into the light because then all my dirt is going to be shown. But this is what the Bible says, and I, I, don't, want, I don't want to misquote it, but this is what the Bible says in John chapter 3, the same section where we saw John three sixteen. It says, for everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone, anyone who lives by the truth and comes to the light, anyone who desires to come to God Anyone who desires to live in the light, you're hearing this message and you're like, okay, like it's, it's really hard for me. It's really hard for me to believe in this message because if I believe in this message, that means what you're saying is that the way that I'm living is not okay. And that's hard for me. But look, this is, this is, what, this is what Jesus says. Anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. If you want to have eternal life, but you are living a lifestyle of sin, Jesus is telling you, just step into the light. Just step into the light. And that lifestyle of sin that you're living in, it will disappear in his light. It will disappear in his light. And all that's gonna be seen is his righteousness, the works that he accomplished, which is dying for your sins on that cross in order to give you eternal life. But you gotta step into the light. You got to believe, you got to receive, like I said earlier, to those who receive Christ, to those he gave the right to be called children of God. We're not all children of God just because we're born, just because we're humans. We're not all children of God. The Bible says you must be born again. But he did this for you because he loves you. He loves you. 
he, he, he decided to prove his love for you by dying on the cross for you. It, it, this, this isn't some abstract, distant deity. We're, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the God of all creation who said, I'm going to prove to you how much I love you. I'm going to prove to you how much I love you. I'm going to die for you. While you're my enemy at that. It's not like we're buddy-buddy and like, oh, I'll take that bullet for you. No. While you are my enemy, I'm going to prove to you how much I love you by dying for you and making salvation possible for you. That's the gospel, you guys. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. And for those of you in here who don't know Jesus, let me tell you, as somebody who does know Jesus, who has come into a saving faith in Jesus Christ, he can change you. He can change you. Like I said, I was, I was, I was a drinker, a partier, all the stuff. When I came to Christ, I still didn't want to give them up. I still wanted to live in those things. But I knew that God, what God was saying was true. And so I said, God, you got to help me. This is hard. Like, God, do you know how fun it is to drink? You know how amazing it feels to be drunk? And I didn't care about the morning after vomiting. I don't care. It's part of it. It's part of the life. But it's just like, God, you got to change me. You've you got to be the one to do it. And as I kept seeking the Lord, as I kept growing in the Lord, man, one day he just, it was like a switch just flipped. I started to hate those things that I used to love so much. And it wasn't because I had a bad experience. It wasn't because I hit rock bottom. It was just like God changed me. God changed me. So if that's you in here and you're living in, you're living in some sort of sin, we're all, we, we were all living in sin at one point because we're all born dead in our sins and our trespasses. But if you're living in some sort of sin and you want to come to Christ, but you're just like, I don't, I, but I just, I can't change. I don't, I don't want to change. But something is telling you that this message is true. Just step into the light and God will change you. But you got to seek him. God doesn't offer his mercy just and, and expects nothing of you. Salvation is free, but God offers his mercy to you with the expectation that you're going to repent, that you're going to walk away from that lifestyle of sin that you're living in. It may not be easy, but as you continue to follow him, the change will occur because the Holy Spirit will change you. He will change your desires. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this night. I thank you that we were able to hear your gospel, God. It's been, it's been a while since we just shared the gospel on a Friday night. So I thank you that we had this opportunity. And God, I just pray that everything that was spoken tonight from your word, uh, that it would be taken seriously, Lord, uh, that we would take it to heart, and that we would meditate on it, Lord that we would seek to be changed by it, Lord, that we would, that we would uh, seek after repentance, that we would chase repentance, Lord. If there's something in our lives that is, is not okay, God, help us to repent. And Lord, I pray for anybody in here who doesn't know you, who uh, they need, they need salvation, they need forgiveness, God. I just, I pray for them, God. I pray that you would open their eyes. I pray that you have opened their eyes, that they would see their great need for salvation. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what sins they have, what, what baggage they're coming with, Lord. If, if you have opened their eyes to recognize that they need your forgiveness, then God, I pray that you would give them the strength, the boldness, to make that profession of faith and to follow you and to repent. And so as, I just, wanna, I, I just wanna present that opportunity to anybody who wants to openly make that profession of faith. So if there's anybody who wants to openly make that profession of faith that they want to come to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation and for repentance because of the love that he showed, um, I want to pray for you. So I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand and um, just know that raising your hand doesn't save you. Um, 
repeating a prayer doesn't save you, but what saves you is you actually believing in what Jesus Christ did for you on that cross. So if there's anybody who wants to receive salvation, receive forgiveness, and receive eternal life, uh, please raise your hand so I can pray for you. I'll give you a few seconds if anybody, maybe you need to work up the courage. Amen. Got the hand high. It's awesome. All right, Lord. Father, I want to pray for, for this young man who raised his hand. And God, I just pray that he would have a, a real understanding of what it means to be saved. We are saved by faith alone, by grace alone. It's only because of what you have done that we have this amazing opportunity to be saved. So I pray that you would know that. God, I pray that you would help him. Help him to die to himself. Help him to repent of anything that may be a barrier between you and him. And God, I pray that you would help him to grow. To grow in his knowledge and understanding of, of Jesus Christ and the word. He would grow in maturity in the Lord. He would grow in, in the assurance of his salvation. I thank you for this night, God, and I pray that you would just be with us as we continue to worship you in this song. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.